Uh, my name is Simon Connor, this is Justin Richards. Um, both of us are lecturers in technology at the University of Salford, and we're also practitioners, freelance practitioners in music technology and uh, music for film, sound and film. And in our presentation, we want to look at two case studies uh, that use audio archive material. Um, and what we hope to reveal is the potential of the process of using this material to create new musical works. Um, to make a distinction, really, our, our kind of um, our distinction between archive material and personal archive material is that we we'll look at those that are not open access, public, or widely available, for those that are hidden at home, in basements, in sheds, and under beds, the attic archives, dictaphones, demo tapes, and dusty forgotten reel to reel tapes of personal audio treasures. And two projects that we'll be looking at are those that use these types of archives. Um, reworking material or embellishing the material. Uh, and the two case studies are Action Space, which, uh, and the documentary film soundtrack in which I work as a sound designer, and then the work of recording artist Gamma, which was produced by Justin Richards. Um, so firstly, to talk about Action Space. Action Space is a documentary film by Hugh Wall, and the film explores the ideas and ethos of an arts collective known as Action Space, who were active between the late 60s and 70s uh, in London, UK. Like many community art projects at the time, they aim to bring art out of the exclusive gallery system to the general public and everyday communities. And they did this by engaging their audiences in large inflatable structures, which they took to local parks, playgrounds, and council estates, like the ones that you can see on the images on the screen. These structures were portable, immersive environments, surreal spaces flooded with light and colour, and sound and music were an integral part of the experiences many members of Action Space were either musicians or sound artists. As the group were avid users of home sound video recording equipment, they amassed a huge personal archive of their public performances and happenings. And as the film's director, Hugh, is son of one of the founding members of Action Space, we were privileged enough to be given free access to this audiovisual archive. So part of my role as sound designer was to digitise the, the, audio, the audio archive, which comprised over 100 hours of material on seven inch reels of quarter inch tape. These comprised of group meetings, radio interviews, public performances, but a large portion of this collection take compositions of several Action Space members, including Alan Nisbet, who was one of the group's founding members. Nisbet was an active musician and sound experimenter. His homemade music on crepe tapes consisted of layered loops of everyday objects, synthetic sounds that shifted between subtle mesmeric drones and more chaotic, percussive and abrasive pieces. So just to give you an idea of some of the individual kind of uh, tapes that he created a mass or just play the short extract. Okay, so back in Action Space's heyday, these tape loops would be played out through multiple speakers inside the inflatables, and these soundscapes would both entice and entertain audiences, often creating very surreal or occasionally chaotic atmospheres within the inflatable. Many of the digitised tapes that I um, digitised were in poor condition due to inadequate storage or neglect. So once digitised, they some required much restriction from digital tools, though this was kept as transparent as possible. All were catalogued with notes on their quality and content, which were then selected and woven through the film as part of the soundtrack. 
However, one of the key themes of the film was revisiting the relevance and ideas of action space in today's world. In doing so, the film focuses on play and experimentation in the arts. The film features four key performances in which artists and musicians perform in a newly created inflatable structure. And as one of these performances, I composed and performed a new piece using ingredients from the given archive. I try here to remain so true to Nisbet's approach, using six tracks over three stereo tape machines, a, bit, a mixer and basic live effects, and the aim was to revisit and recontextualize his ideas through the layering and manipulating his original recordings. So I'm just going to play you now a short extract of that performance using the archive material. Time. But the use of limited equipment then in this given performance is at first challenging, um, especially when compared to the wealth of available resources available today to musicians, such as DAW functions, plugins, and digital processing. However, I found these initial restrictions ultimately became liberating and gave me a very healthy respect for the work of Nisbet, who all, by, by all accounts had only very basic home recording equipment. As you can hear, the recordings are low fidelity, far from pristine condition, but very much about energy and experimentation, much in the vein of action space, who championed this DIY approach far more than precision and perfection. This didn't stop this bit from being extremely prolific, however. In fact, the wealth of material from the archive meant we had far too much to fit in the film. So to coincide with the film's release, myself and the uh, director, Hugh Wall, performed for several audiovisual sets at film festivals that use both the archive and video um, footage and improvise new performances. Again, this allowed us to bring alive the archive, finding different ways to share it with new audiences. But ultimately, what is gained then from unearthing and performing this particular archive? Well, the film is about reinvestigating and reigniting the ideas of action space, DIY approaches to art, the importance of play and experimentation. As Professor Julia Nodegraaf argues, this audiovisual heritage can often, of, often offer a direct sensation of the past, or, as Hal Foster claims, 
audio material such as this or audio archive can serve as found arts of lost moments in which the here and now of the work serves as a possible portal between an unfinished past and a reopening future. Um, and although that Foster in this moment is talking about visual contemporary works, I would argue this is no less the case when using the evocative, evocative medium of personal audio archives. So at this point, I'd like to hand over to Justin. Thanks very much, Simon. Um, my aim is to describe how a, record, a recording artist I'm working with is now making use of material that was recorded 30 years ago uh, to create a new set of albums that consist of uh, enhanced versions of existing tracks or previously unheard material that had been deemed unreleasable due to low quality. The artist I've been working with is called Gamma, and during the 1980s he collaborated with Vinnie Riley and Jurassic Cohen, producing a large body of work. Some of this was released under his own name, um, but an equal amount of co-written songs remained unreleased as demos or very rough ideas. About 15 years ago, Gamma went through the process of transferring as much material as possible onto Pro Tools sessions at effects rentals in London. This process was time-consuming, and the results have unfortunately revealed many issues with the quality of media, as well as the selection of the playback devices. The only thing I'd like to mention regarding this specific technical issue is the importance of lining up tape machines for each different tape type. So I'd like to show you some of the techniques used to enhance and embellish these recordings. I'm just going to flip over to Pro Tools. Okay. Um, this first one, Coffee in the Kitchen, uh, was recorded onto an 8-track 30 years ago. The three 12-string guitars, a stereo drum machine and a shaker. Uh, the original lead vocal has been replaced with a new performance. And to this, some backing vocals have been added and a new bass line. Um, so let's have a quick listen. leave it there because you get the idea that recording quality is generally pretty good. Um, but let's have a quick listen to the backing vocal BB1 track. Now obviously there's some dodgy wiring there from the tape output to the door input. Fortunately, copy and paste can fix these kind of things, uh, but does demonstrate the importance of fastidious monitoring and checking during the transfer process. Signing up performances is relatively easy, um, and this contributes to a simple but fairly high performance, high quality production. However, I'll flip to another version. Uh, the artist recorded a completely different version with Vinnie Riley playing acoustic guitar as a demo, recorded onto a dictaphone. Let's take a put this. So you can hear the general low quality, lots of mains, hum, hiss. Um, and in addition to this, Gamma wanted the new version to be much slower. So I use time stretching and various software packages to deal with the denoising and de hum. And then the addition of subtle echo and reverb to get the guitar to sound a little bit closer to his usual recognised sound. So it ends up sounding a little bit like this. And to make the backing a little bit more homogeneous, we added um, a double of inner parts in the form of a lo-fi piano pan to the opposite side. Okay, but even after processing, there's still quite a bit of history remaining. So to mask this, we added a shaker, and that then implies using more percussion instruments. So we added some simple cajon and djembe parts to make the whole percussion arrangement a bit more plausible. This is a exploratory arrangement in the moment, um, in the moment 
and it's work in progress, but have a listen to the whole thing now. Okay, so having no click track and natural temp tempo fluctuations in Vinny's performance meant that the added percussion had to be edited to match it. I regard this as a positive use uh, of being able to see the audio's waveform on screen, unlike the usual trap of staring at it and not really listening to what's actually going on. It could be argued that it would have been better to use the higher quality multi-track version as a platform to carry on with, but it wasn't Vinny Ryder playing guitar and Gamma's keen to have as many versions available as we record. So, final example. Um, this track is an example of how I was asked if the artist could change the lyrics in a song with only access to a stereo mix. This has been a request for many songs, and different tracks require different approaches. But one way is to find musically suitable vocal free material from the rest of the song and use this to replace the section with the offending lyric. First two tracks. Uh, in the Pro Tools session, kind of show how I did this. So this is the original backing, uh, sort of rough, I suppose it was a finished mix at the time. So, for Mad Assassins was the lyric he wanted to change. So what ended up happening was, as you can see, the volume of that has been dipped, and the track below it, is used to kind of fill it in. So you can hear subtle errors in the timing and uh, the mix balance, but it's not too bad, hopefully. Um, we then tracked two new vocals underneath, and um, what I'm going to do, I'm just going to time, I'm going to go straight to the finished mix. But in terms of tracking vocals to replace, uh, it's kind of many problems because the voice is 30 years older, the performances are bound to have different emotion and different energy. Uh, I also have no idea what microphone or preamp was used on the original recording. So a lot of automation of EQ and harmonic processing was used to try and match the two sounds. So let's go straight to the, again, another work in progress mix. Okay, um, so to conclude, um, there's an overriding theme of requiring both musical and technical skills equally to creatively enhance and expand a personal archive. It's vital that experience and knowledge are not allowed to inform the decision making processes. I've started many sessions by saying it's not possible to the artist's requests, only to look back months and years later and noticing that actually we achieved it. Uh, I think one of Led Zeppelin's engineers said that the day you say that's not going to work to an idea that's been tried many times before and failed is the day you need to leave the profession. So, uh, to reuse any archive material in an innovative way, it's more about having a wider approach to creativity and musicality. You may already know the subject matter, but in order to be inspiring, approaching source material in a radically different way is possibly a good way to start. Hopefully you will have seen that with film or music, the quality of the original capture does not have to be a restriction. It's more about how you layer or treat the source material. Finding and recognising the essence of the piece of media is more important than trying to meet a standard of quality more akin to modern outputs. Thanks for listening. Are there any questions? A similar thing with a uh, you know a band I was in 40 years ago, you know, one of the main singer, 
uh, wanting to do not quite as complex, but you know, use some old demos and, and bring it up to date. And a bit like you said, uh, one of the biggest problems was matching the vocals. I mean, amongst the many other, you know, you've got over other problems. But uh, have you got to the point at all in this where either we can't technically match it and we can't creatively match it, so we just have to leave it and, and, and work with the original? Has it ended up? It's up there, uh, there are times when, yes, you have to leave the original, but he is just kind of like a dog with a bone. Right. And so if you want something, you just keep at it, keep at it, keep at it. And there are some which work really, really well, and there are others which I've come back to many, many times over many years and just re cure it, reprocess it, and you just can't, you can't do it. Um, it's that combination of the actual performance itself is never going to sound the same as what it's been the singers. Yeah. Let alone the actual sonic differences in probably his voice as well. Yeah, exactly. uh, there's only so far you can go. But if he's happy with it, then that's good. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, sorry, did you help me out? Sorry, sorry. It's just, <laughs> just around. <laughs> yeah. Hi, um, I wanted to ask you about the tape collection. Um, I feel all the pain of uh, trying to digitise an audio archive and I'm currently dealing with about 1500 Coolidge tapes from the 60s and 70s in our school music archive um, and it's all on Ampex which is some of the most problematic with the um, control system and all that stuff and I wondered what, um, how many tapes are you in digitising and what's the sort of percentage of, um, of, uh, of branding? Are you, are you noticing any um, differences between the conditions in certain brands? Slight differences, yeah. I mean, as you saw from the photo tape before, there was a lot of different, there was Ampex, there was Scotch tape, um, yeah. Maxwell, I think, as well. There's lots of different types. So, and in all, I think there was about 40 or 50 tapes that we digitised, uh, some of which were kept in very good condition and kept in the original boxes and kept in dry places. And then some, for example, Hugh, the director's dad, Ken was one of the family members, but he's quite uh, yeah, carefree with his storage, shall we say? So it wasn't in boxes, it was just kind of left sprawled around. And some things that we on digitised, we then had to use quite a few restoration tools, digital ones, to, to restore. And they weren't so much the music, they were actually things like Greek meetings, but they were very important to the, the film and the story of the film, actually, because one of those was the breakup of action space was documented on tape, which is one of the Greek meetings. And this is the one, one ones we had to kind of salvage in the end, using kind of digital restoration tools to make sure that that story was audible, otherwise it would have just been a lot of hiss and would have needed subtitles and stuff. So, it was really varied, but um, thankfully most things were able to be salvaged. There were a few that we weren't able to include in, in the film that were just too poor quality, unfortunately. And how old are the tapes? So the tapes, primarily, I think most of the tapes are probably from somewhere before Action Space, so somewhere from about 66, and then I think they used them up to, yeah, we've been past the end of action space, so I think probably till just before the 80s, so, yeah, quite old. So you're lucky that they're in good condition. Yeah, very lucky. The, our Ampex is just completely disintegrating, Where, whereas the Scotch, which was a much more consumer level type of tape, just yeah. plays like it was recorded yesterday. Yeah, so well, thankfully, a lot of it, it's not professional, really, equipment that you had. It was home yeah. reel to reel tapes, and there were things like Scotch. There wasn't really, yeah. thankfully, a lot of Ampex. And, there's not many places left that do the baking of tapes of something great at Manchester um, and Papa Well does a lot of that kind of work and he's always found his kids yeah, and I guess I'd see why. Another question? Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, so, as an audiovisual artist, uh, I'm a big proponent of this live leaves and why see stuff. You're not gonna, it's not going to have a life, so uh, great work on that front. I just wanted to mention, I, I would kind of ask, and it's, it's kind of dipping on this. Uh, first of all, if you have any scientific community on your campus, just a normal scientific incubator to do. Okay. 
Right. Yes, it's a piece of case, but it's no big deal. Thermal treatment is, 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 a, it, is it works. Okay. Um, but um, my thing is, you've got these diverse collections in people's personal collections. They want to reuse them. There is a resource hit in order to do that. You have to, you have to recover the data. You have to deal with the tapes. And there's a cost to that. And so my question, I guess, is, is when someone approaches you with a project like this, when you look at the, the cost of you know, doing the proper digitization first, would go a long way, but that's probably the most expensive thing to do, other than just kind of get on with it and then try to restore stuff later. Yeah. But from our archival perspective, it's frightening to like, oh, we're just going to fix stuff later because we don't have the resources. It's always a resource problem. So I guess my question is, in both of these cases, funding the project, how is that approached? Because the, the, the preservation part of this was also part of the project. Yeah, um, I know that in Gamma's case, I was I was in, involved in the transfer, and I kind of wish I was. <laughs> yeah, what you got? Yeah, because I think it, it, they just got a block deal. Here's a load of tape machines. Just get on with it. It was wired up to Pro Tools, and I don't think whoever was around doing that kind of took as much care as it should have been taken. Each machine should have been lined up for each tape. They should have had a test tape for each. You know. It's, which is an awful lot to ask, but yeah. that's how it should have been done. And it was like, he hired the place for a day, and that was it. So he just got the best out of what he could. Um, he didn't transfer everything he had, but yeah, it would have maybe taken three or four days to do it properly. So. Was there anything baked along the way? No, there was no baking no bacon. quite, unfortunately. It was just straight transfers. <laughs> and a lot of it was from dictaphone, you can hear. Oh. <laughs> and one of the problems I actually had with the dictaphone and stuff was, it was a mono dictaphone recorder, but it was played back on a stereo dictaphone device. So you get issues between the left and the right, mm. and even when you sum them to mono afters, you hear the volume going on there. So this kind of like, oh, it shouldn't have been played back from a stereo device in the first place. So there's a lot of kind of issues on playing it back to be digital. Once it's digitized, that is, and then on. Yeah. I think, it, well, in my experience, <laughs> I was a little foolish in. I said yes to a lot of, well, I just wanted to be involved as, as in, this, in the film. I was really interested and I thought, you know, there wasn't a big budget, it's tiny budget, and I just thought this can be amazing, create potential. I knew about this archive, I didn't know how much there was. I knew about this and I knew about action space. I thought, well, what a fantastic project to be involved with. So it was, it was a passion project, and I said yes, before realizing how many boxes, oh, I've got these boxes <laughs> in the archive, and you know, it's like, over 50 tapes of stuff that needs to be digitized before we can then even think about constructing the soundtrack or even thinking about, you know, like I say, some of those tapes actually had a um, quite importance in the narrative of the film, you know, things like the breaking up of the group and how we introduce that and how the story kind of evolves, really. So I did, I did all the digitization myself and was kind of new to it. So the first few tapes I actually do because I was, you know, kind of learned through doing. Um, and yeah, I, I really enjoyed it, but it, you're totally right, it was a massive time-consuming task to do. Just as a very quick aside, um, one of the pieces of software we used uh, was uh, uh, Salomonese Capstan software, which is just an incredible piece of gear. It, if you've got wear well and flutter, or any kind of very slow variation of tape speed, it sorts it all out, which is absolutely incredible. There's just no other software that I know of that does that. What's it called? Capstan. Capstan yeah. The University of Huddersfield, inspiring tomorrow's professionals.